Now listen, sweetheart, the Federation's moving in. We're taking over. You play ball, we'll cut you in for a piece of the pie. You don't, you're out. All the way out, you know what I mean? Bridge to all decks. It's a hit here on Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. I'm Scott Nance. And I'm Steve Morris, and I kept trying to come up with good jokes in the lingo that I was going to say to come back to you, and they all sounded stupid. So let me just say that this is one of my favorite episodes, and I am super excited to talk a piece of the action. So excited to talk about a piece of the action, and so excited to join our very special guest to join us for our deep dive of a piece of the action. He is a veteran entertainment journalist who was the editor-in-chief of Not of This Earth, Earth, which I have some issues of, and he was the senior editor of Cinescape, Femme Fatales, and Cinefantastique. He is currently the senior editor of Geek Magazine and nostalgia editor for DoYouRemember.com, and he is the writer of numerous oral nonfiction books, including with co-author Mark Altman, who is my good friend, the oral histories of Star Trek in the two-volume 50-year mission series, also Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Slayers and Vampires, Battlestar Galactica's oral history, which I was interviewed for, called So Say We All, which is fantastic, James Bond, Nobody Does It Better, and Star Wars Secrets of the Force. And he's also my very good friend. Welcome, Ed Gross. Thank you, sir. What a lovely introduction. Well, the first question we're going to have here, Ed, is for you. What were your initial thoughts of A Piece of the Action when you first saw them? And and how has this episode held up for you over these years? I I, I mean, I saw this one after, well, obviously, it's the original run, so (laughs) after Trouble with Triples. And that obviously changed the show quite a bit within the introduction of humor. So this was, it was fun to see another Earth-like planet with the humor in it. Uh, The thing that hasn't aged well for me is when they go to goofy music and stuff during the show, like during some of the fights and stuff, and like the music gets a little silly. Uh, But overall, it's fun watching them out of their environment and and, and just trying to adapt as fast as they can (laughs) with Kirk really diving into it full force. An important part of it, it occurs to me, it's the strangest analogy in the world. It reminds me of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein because you've got in that film, you've got Bud and Lou acting like Bud and Lou. You've got Bella Lugosi, Lon Chaney Jr., Glenn Strange, everybody else acting like they should be acting. They weren't spoofing themselves. And although Shatter gets into the spirit of the thing, the truth is they're Kirk and Spock and McCoy. And here are these dopey gangsters and they stay true to who they are through the whole thing. And I always found that to be a fun element to the show. What about you, Steve? Because Ed is part of the original generation because he watched Star Trek in its original run between 1966 and 1969. Steve and I are part of the syndication generation. We're a little bit younger, so we discovered Star Trek in the early 70s when it was on you know, UHF five nights a week. And, and that's why we're really... Star Trek became, you know, quote unquote, Star Trek and got so popular that they made 13 movies and, you know, another another 12 TV shows and counting. But Steve, what about you? What are your thoughts on a piece of the action? And and like like how have you how have you liked it over these years? So I know that the general fan favorite comedy episode of Star Trek is Trouble with Tribbles. This is my favorite of the comedy Star Treks. I love it. And I totally get what you're saying, Ed, about those some of the music cues and things like that. But I have so much fun watching this episode. I always have. And I think the reason is, is that I can see Shatner and Nimoy having so much fun doing this. Uh, You know, not only are Shatner and Nimoy having fun, but uh, Anthony Caruso and Vic Tabak are also having fun. Everybody is having fun. Uh, Even DeForest Kelly in his own McCoy way is having fun. And I'm with you, Steve, of the three comedy episodes, which Trouble with Tribbles and I, Mud and A Piece of the Action, the, 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 the three episodes that were full on comedies and were intended to be that way. I get why Trouble with Tribbles is the fan favorite. It's so accessible. It's sort of the Star Trek four of original series episodes and that even non fans love it. And even non people who, who don't know Star Trek know what a triple is, but of the three 
I always favor a piece of the action, A, because it is the most fun, but also because, quite frankly, I think it's the coolest of the three <laughs> episodes. It's just the coolest of the three episodes. It's an episode that I've always loved. It, it is in my top 10. And I have to say, one of the reasons why I just have a personal connection to this episode is because it is photo novel number eight. You and your photo now, novels. <laughs> the reason I bring up the photo novels, is because Steve especially knows this, because every episode we've done that has a photo novel companion, I brought that up. And, and everyone who's been listening to Enterprise Incidents, and Ed, you know this too, is that for me, the photo novels are, are the, 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 the rosebud of my Star Trek collection. <laughs> but the reason that a piece of the action is the holy grail of my Star Trek collection is because photo novel number eight for a piece of the action is the very first piece of Star Trek merchandise I ever, ever, wow. ever wow. bought. So that photo novel, which I still have in my possession and is still in the exact same condition that I bought it in, in 1978, uh, it, you know, that's where it all start. That's where my Star Trek collection started for me. So, so, so that is why, and Ed, uh, following our deep dive of a piece of the action, we have a very special interview with the, with the episode's director, James Comack, conducted by Ed. Tell us about this interview I was very, very young in my career, so don't anybody make fun of that uh, <laughs> questioning and stuff. I was really a few years into it. It was a period where I was just going out and realized I had a little niche for myself by interviewing uh, different writers and directors from the original Star Trek. Uh, and James Comack was great. I couldn't tell you how I got him. I don't remember anymore, but uh, <laughs> he just seemed to have enjoyed the episode. He enjoyed talking about it. I knew James Comack from, you know, Uncle Norman from The Courtship of Eddie's Father. Um, yep. And it was just a fun back and forth talking about, you know, how he compared, uh, you know, the guys had, in the gangsters had uh, intellects of the, the size of room temperature or something or like really <laughs> low. And uh, it was just great. It was just fun. You know, it was just really, it's always fun to tap into the things you love and being able to talk to people about them. And that was how I looked at the James Comack interview. So, so James Comack is the director of A Piece of the Action. He was an extremely prolific writer, producer, and director. As a writer, he wrote for My Favorite Martian. As a director, he directed episodes of The Dick Van Dyke Show and Get Smart. And as a producer, in addition to starring on The Courtship of Eddie's Father, he produced the series as well as Chico and the Man and Welcome Back, Cotter. So he is he is a legend. He is a legend in the business. This is the only Star Trek episode he directed, and they went to him specifically because – they knew that this was a special episode and he was the perfect person to direct it. And he was judging by the results. So a piece of the action was written by David P. Harmon and Gene L. Kuhn from a story by David P. Harmon. Harmon, this is his second Star Trek teleplay because he wrote The Deadly Years. But in actuality, the origins for a piece of the action go back to Gene Roddenberry's one page proposal for Star Trek written in March of 1964, where there was a bullet point for a story called President Capone and the description, a parallel world, Chicago, 10 years after Al Capone won and imposed gangland statutes upon a nation. So as Star Trek was getting into its first season, George Clayton Johnson took that proposal idea and submitted the syndicate for the first season, but then he got busy with the first episode that aired called The Man Trap. So then that kind of fell by the wayside. So then David P. Harmon picked it up and then his story outline came in on August 8th, 1967. And at that point it was called The Expatriates. He did a couple of drafts. His second draft teleplay came in on September 5th. So at this point, this was right around the time that Gene Kuhn stepped down in September of 1967. But he offered, after he stepped away, to do a page one rewrite where he turned it into a full-blown comedy because there were a lot of problems with Harmon's teleplay. And Dorothy Fontana, at one point in describing 
Harmon's teleplay to like Bob Justman and Gene Kuhn at the time, she described it as a piece of dreck. So that that's that was like awful. I'm glad I if I was Harmon and I read that, I would have been uh, really, really upset. But anyway, so Gene Kuhn did his rewrite, the new first draft teleplay where it was called Mission into Chaos on September 28th. He did a revised draft, a revised draft of the first three acts in early October of 67, where it was then called finally a piece of the action. And then he revised the fourth act on October 25th. And then the staff under producer John Meredith Lucas, a final draft teleplay came in on October 30th. Piece of the action aired on January 12th, 1968. It was the 46th episode to air, but it was actually the 50th episode to film, including the cage. It was shot in six days on schedule, which is impressive for a first time Star Trek director between November 2nd and November 9th, 1967. Also impressive for a first time Star Trek director directing an episode with a whole lot of sets and costume design. The episode cost $176,171, bringing it under budget by more than $6,000. Helping matters was that the score was tracked. And in Harmon's original outline, uh, the Enterprise was pursuing a ship of Earth expatriates, which is why he called it the the expatriates, who were influenced by the book, the book being the, the Chicago mobs of the 20s. But then Bob Justman had the idea that these people should come not from Earth, but from their own planet. And that's when Kuhn added that this planet evolved after being influenced by a book left behind by a previous starship. So two things about this, Scott, that surprised me. The first is it surprises me that this came in under budget. It seems like it would have a much higher budget with all the cars and costumes and lots of extras. But the other thing that seems very surprising to me is that Gene Kuhn came back to do this. A, that he was willing to come back because it sounded like it was pretty upsetting when he left. And B, if the big upset was that the show had become too comedic, why would they bring Gene Kuhn back to turn a more serious episode into a comedy? I don't understand what happened here. Well, those are absolutely great and valid questions. But from what I read, and I read this in in Mark Cushman's These Are the Voyages Volume 2, is that, first of all, when... When Star Trek was picked up, finally, after Games of Triskelion, for the back end of the second season, they had to rush into production Mm. pretty fast because they had to finish out the season. And A Piece of the Action was a troubled screenplay under David Harmon. Gene Gene Kuhn felt extremely confident that he could really do something with it if he was able to do his thing and turn it into a comedy. And Roddenberry just let him do it. Roddenberry Mm. normally did have issues with the humor, but in this case, he just let Gene Kuhn do his thing. And Gene Kuhn really had the last laugh here because the episode came out great. Actually, you brought up the thing about you're surprised that the show came in under budget. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was a concentrated effort though. That's why we started getting more shows taking place on Earth-like planets uh, because Bread and Circuses wasn't far behind. It was like they were trying to save money any which way they could and using back lots and costumes and things that were just there uh, was allowed them to sort of try to do that and control the budget a little. Well, Bread Circuses was filmed before this. You know, Gene Kuhn was still had just stepped away uh, and and, and, uh, John Meredith Lucas. But that was kind of like his unofficial first episode. But it was after this one, after a piece of the action that you had you know, patterns of force, you know, right. planet of the Nazis. Right. You know. That's another one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think that's probably the Both least fell into the same pattern though. You know, yeah. my, my least favorite of the planet of the whatevers. Um, but uh, this, you know, I, I had said that bread and circuses was my favorite of those, you know, planets, you know, uh, 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 parallel earth type things. But, but this one is, is, is great. Uh, you know, when I was doing my rewatch of PC, the action, I was like, this episode is awesome. Uh, would you like to know some of the things going on in the world while they were filming this episode? Yes, absolutely. So here's the, here's, what's weird. There is a weird thing about these events. And that is, if you go remember way back to the beginning of the season two, 
we had the thought of let's not talk about what was going on when they filmed the episode. Let's talk about what was going on when the episode was released. And then after a couple episodes, we decided that was a really bad idea. Well, guess what? We've arrived at the place where we've already talked about some of these events. But the, as you, it was filmed between November 2nd and the 9th, on the 2nd, Lyndon Johnson, who's continually struggling with what to do about the Vietnam War, calls in a meeting of what came to be known as the Wise Men. And this included Dean Atchison and McGeorge Bundy and Henry Cabot Lodge and said, what do I do? How do I get Americans on board with the Vietnam War? And their advice was only say the good stuff. Yeah. Only say optimistic reports. And right at the same time, one of the largest battles in the entire Vietnam War happened. The Battle of Doc To began. Um, and then on the 5th of November, the ATS-3, Applications Technology Satellite Launches. This is the first satellite to take color pictures of the Earth. It was supposed to run for three years. It worked for a decade, taking pictures of the Earth. And then this is the stuff we already talked about, so I'm just going to say it quick, which is the Phil Donahue show started. The public broadcasting system was created when LBJ signed that. The first issue of Rolling Stone happened. The Saturn rockets were launching again because we're back into the Apollo missions. And that is what was going on in the world when they were filming. And who was on the cover of the first issue of Rolling Stone? Ladies and gentlemen. LBJ John Lennon. LBJ John Lennon. Lennon, And it was a picture of John Lennon while he was filming How I Won the War, directed by Richard Lester, who directed A Hard Day's Night and Help. So that's your <laughs> Beatles trivia for Enterprise Incidents. There you go. <laughs> Shall we get into the episode? Approaching Sigma Yosho 2, Captain. And that is the last we see or hear of Walter Koenig in a piece of the action. And all the scenes on the bridge of the Enterprise were actually filmed on day six. And, and I was at first I thought, like, why would they shoot? shoot the Enterprise bridge scene so late into the production of the episode. But then I remembered what Ralph Sinensky was saying when he was talking about bread and circuses. And he said, no, 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 we would shoot all the, the location stuff first so that we could take advantage of, of good conditions and good weather. And then we would shoot the rest of the stuff later. So, so that is why the Enterprise bridge scenes were, sh- were shot on, on the last day of production. I have received vocal contact from an official station. They relate us to a man named Oxlix. His title is Boss. Boss. So right away, we know that something is a little different. We talk to him. You're from the same outfit as the Horizon? Yes. Unfortunately, the Horizon was lost with all hands shortly after leaving your planet. We only received her radio report last month. Last month? What are you talking about? The Horizon left here 100 years ago. Um, And there are a couple of moments where Kirk is... Tr- struggling to explain some science fiction concepts. But finally, they say, well, we're going to beam down. And the guy gives them an intersection to beam down to. And Kirk, I love the way Kirk going to beam down, grabs Spock and McCoy by the arms and pulls yes. them into the turbo lift. Exactly what I was going to comment on. <laughs> I love the, those moments. You know, the, isn't that, Ed, like, like sort of the first indication of like the tone of this episode? Like Spock and McCoy are walking out of the turbo lift and, you know, Kirk grabs him both by, by each arm and says, Spock, McCoy, we're beaming down, standard equipment. <laughs> they just look at each other and walk back into the turbo lift. That This is where, where I feel like, you, you know, you have such great chemistry between William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly. And the chemistry is so great that even when the tone shifts to a comedy, it is still, the chemistry is still oh. great. The chemistry still works. You know, it's funny. I also, after I watched a piece of the action again, I went back to Space Seed for some reason. I decided to watch that. And even in, you've got this dramatic thing happening of the Botany Bay showing up, and yet you have those little moments between Kirk and Spock, just like with Kirk saying, one of my human wounds, Mr. Spock. You know, and it's like, it just cracks me up that like, even in a tense moment like that, you can still have those little moments of these guys' humor in this dramatic moment. That, that's the levity, the levity that we talk about often, especially on the episodes that Gene Kuhn either wrote or produced, right. where you have drama and then you have these great moments of levity. You know, Space Seed, he wrote, or he co wrote that screenplay. Yeah. And, you know, in this one, he did such a, a huge rewrite on a piece of the action that he got a screenplay credit with David Harmon. At least David Harmon got a screenplay credit, I have to say. It's funny. The only other show I can think of that's capable of going from fully serious, like heavy serious, 
through a mix of serious and comedy to fully silly. The only other show I can think of that does that is MASH. You know, uh, other oh. than that, I can't think of a single TV show that has that wide a range as, you know, between I Mud and Balance of Terror. You know, that's that's a long way to go. The Horizon's contact came before the non-interference director went into effect. They must have interfered with the normal evolution of the planet. And the other thing we hear is that this culture is very smart and imitative. Imitative is the key word here, as we will soon see. <laughs> Um, we show up at the transporter room. One thing I think is funny is that their communicators and their phasers are just kind of sitting on the console <laughs> and they get handed out there. It seems very strange. And we go to beam down and there we land on a corner, almost getting hit by a car on a planet. And it is Chicago in the 20s with p people in outfits. And not only that, cool old antique cars and a whole bunch of people carrying a whole bunch of guns. This is like coming home. Home was never like this. We are already seeing that the, the contamination left behind by the horizon, but the source of that contamination, we don't know yet. And then out of the blue comes a guy, two guys wearing pinstripe suits and hats and carrying Tommy guns. We hear Kalo say, Okay, you three, let's see you petrified. So Kalo is played by Lee Delano. And on film, he worked a lot with, uh, with Mel Brooks, because he was in Silent Movie, High Anxiety, History of the World Part One, also films like Splash and the Birdcage. On TV, he was on The Lieutenant, produced by Roddenberry, Batman, Mission Impossible, Ironside, The Rocker Files, and Charlie's Angels. The other guy standing next to him is very familiar to Star Trek fans who've been paying really, really, really close attention like we have. That is stuntman Jay Jones, who had a couple of really spectacular and very painful stunts in episodes like Who Mourns for Adonais, uh, The Apple, and Cat's Paw. Sir, would you mind explaining that statement, please? I want to see it turn to stone. Put your hands over your head. You ain't going to have no head to put your hands over. Which gives no indication at all of how humorous the episode's going to be because if you were just to judge it on that you know the opening sequence and then here in act one it's like or you just don't get a sense of this is going to be funny you just get a sense like we're in a we're in a gangster thing and these guys lives are in serious danger what's this now that's a weapon uh, be careful of that a heater huh what we see that's so cool in this episode is the evolution of the way that they speak to the people on this planet because they start off as formal and polite, in particular Spock, in trying to relate to them, and none of that is working. Sir, does everyone here carry firearms? I never heard such stupid questions in my life. Well, since this oxmas asked us down here, don't you think we should see him? All right. It starts off as a fish out of water story, and it turns into, if you can't beat him, join him story. So this is day three, because as they're moving down the street, we see a car come around the corner, and it's a hit. It's a hit from one of the other bosses, and uh, the other guy who's uh, with Kalo goes flying back. And of course, you know Jay Jones uh, finishes his stunt for this episode. So this was filmed on the McFadden Street backlot on Paramount Studios. And right after this hit, um, of course, our guys are just in shock. And then McCoy, we've been joking about McCoy not being a very good doctor in first aid situations. This time he doesn't even go over to the guy. He says, that man's dead over there. And then, yeah. <laughs> What's the matter, you guys never saw a hit before? And Spock, again, totally formally says, Sir, there are several questions I would like to ask. Ask the boss, I don't know nothing. And then as they're walking, up come some women with some complaints about street lamps and laundry pickups. Listen, we pay our percentages we're entitled to a little service for our money, huh? Get lost, will you? Well, I have to say that one of the things that I re-admired watching this episode is the costume design of Bill Tice. To Ed, I mean, you know, uh, being a fan of the original series, I mean, you know, Bill Tice's outfits uh, usually get known for like what Leslie Parrish wore and Who Mourns Outer Nights, oh, right. or what, what Sherry Jackson wore and What a Little Girl's Made Of. But then you have an episode like this where it's 1920s Chicago and the costume design is really fantastic. And, uh, you know, Bill Tice was a genius. 
He was a genius, but he also probably had a lot of that stuff there. I mean, because of the Paramount Studios, yeah, Desilu yeah. Studios, rather. Hmm? Oh, that's true. That's yeah, a good they point. just that went to the warehouse. That's which is why they, those sets were there too. Those back lots were were perfect for this. They had them right there, and I don't know if that was for the Untouchables or something. I have no idea, but uh, the costumes and the sets, yeah, they both probably were just like, okay, what can we use that exists? I don't think this is a deep episode. I'm not going to try to say that this is a deep episode, but I do want to point out a couple of things I find interesting. And one of them is we talk about these women, they pay their percentages and they expect to get services. And there's this weird way of like, this is just actually a government because the percentages are taxes. And for the taxes, the people expect to get what you get from a government. It really is. It's it just because it looks like gangsters doesn't make it less of a real government from any other government. Um, and speaking of which, we're about to reach the uh, the boss, the dictator, because there is Bella Oxmix at his desk with a, what I can only describe as a gun mall sitting there. Bella Oxmix, played by Anthony Caruso, who played a heavy many, many times in film and in TV. And he also, ironically, played a, a Native American quite a few times in film and on TV. I know I, I, uh, I, I don't get that, yeah. but on film, his very first film was in 1940. It was called Johnny Apollo. He was also in the iron mistress, the asphalt jungle cattle queen of Montana and the lawless eighties on TV. He was on shows like Zorro death Valley days, the untouchables, of course, the untouchables, my gosh, half <laughs> gun will travel bonanza wild wild west and Gunsmoke. and what's interesting about anthony caruso is for that photo novel photo novel number eight in the beginning there was a two-page interview and and i remember reading it and it said anthony caruso so i thought it was an interview with anthony caruso but what it actually was was uh an interview with bella oxmix hmm. translated to Anthony Caruso. So he basically did this interview in character as Bella Oxmix. And I'll, I'll never forget that because I thought that was really, really cool. And Anthony Caruso is right on point with this episode. He chooses scenery and he is fantastic at it. He's over the top in all the right ways. And his performance is also like, like, like he's, he's, he's a charming guy. He seems like a nice guy, but then when he puts his foot down, he's dangerous. Which one of you guys is captain? Depends. <laughs> Make yourself a drink, Captain. It's good stuff. I just stole it myself. And I love that Kirk picks up the pool cue and is trying to figure out, like, what do you do with this thing? They call you the boss, Mr. Oxmix. The boss of what? The boss of my territory. I got the biggest in the world. So Oxmix, uh, you know, I, I, I noticed this a long time ago. So Oxmix is playing pool, but he's not really playing pool. Oh, yeah. He's kind of picking <laughs> up whatever ball he wants and hitting it. I was going to bring that up. That was so weird to me. Is like he hit the cue ball once and everything else was hitting the other balls into the cue ball. Yeah. And then the cue ball is like coming back. It's about to go in the pocket. He grabs it before it does. Yeah. Uh, he's not playing pool in the right way in any sense of the word, but it still looks cool for the sake of the episode. Can I give you two explanations of this? Because, of course, I noticed the same thing. Yes. Ex explanation number one is in the big book of 1920 Chicago. It said there was this game pool, but it didn't actually explain the rules. So they have invented their own version of pool. That's one explanation. Here is the actual explanation is that he needed to be in a certain position for the shot and you couldn't predict where the balls were going to be. So in order to be on his mark, to be in the right place with the camera, he had to shoot whatever ball was available in front of him. And exactly. That is what he did. That's what they did. But there are other bosses, other territories. Yeah, sure. Maybe a dozen or so. Does that include, if I may ask, a gentleman called Krakow? How do you know about Krakow? He hit us, boss. He He's pissed. He, he turns around. He's like, like you know, of all, all the crime bosses, Krakow is clearly his arch enemy. And I like that we're hearing about Krakow before we actually meet him. And this is when Spock notices this big, huge book that says, Chicago Mobs of the 20s. Published, by the way, in deep in the future in 1992. <laughs> um, Where'd you get this? Hey, wait a minute. That's the book. I know, it's a book. The book. They left it. The other ship, the Horizon. So here's, here's the contamination left behind by the Horizon. What, one thing I wonder is, uh, do you know the book uh, A Canticle for Leibowitz? Never heard. It's a classic sci-fi book from the 50s. 
And the whole idea of it is that after a, it's like a post-apocalyptic world and they find a few records and they build an entire religion based on these few things that they found that they totally misinterpret. And I just wonder if, or my guess is they read that book. Not that it's really exactly the same thing, but it's definitely, you know, a similar idea. Look, I brought you down here so you could help me, not for you to ask me questions. After that, I'll answer anything you want to know. What is it you want? He wants heaters. So just give me what I need to knock off the other bosses so I can be in charge. And of course, uh, I like Sp Spock's response. He goes, fascinating. And then he skips it because everybody looks at him. Uh, McCoy looks at him and he goes, uh, but quite impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I'm in no way saying this is a deep episode, but you want to know what other episode this reminded me of? Or do you have what a was? guess? It's a private little war. One okay. side wants weapons to take out the other side. Yeah. yeah. This is the light, fun, silly version of a very heavy, complicated episode. But here's the difference. In a private little war, the weapons, which were which were not, not on the level of what the Klingons had, they were just more advanced weapons, flintlocks, already had been supplied to the villagers. Right. When that's like when the enterprise got there, that had already happened. In this case, neither side has been furnished with weapons. You know, Ox Mix wants the weapons, but of course, because of what they experienced on the neural planet in a private little war, and of course, because of the prime directive itself, and because Kirk is a smart guy with common sense, there's no way, <laughs> there is absolutely no way in the world that Kirk is going to furnish Oxmith, Oxmiths with heaters to knock off the other bosses. There's no way that's going to happen. My orders are quite explicit. Under I no ain't interested in your orders. And from now on, you're going to take orders from me. I'm going to give you just eight hours to give me the things I want. If I don't have those tools by then, I'm going to call up your ship and have them pick you up in a box. So here's why I think that Anthony Caruso's performance is right on point. Because, like I said, he was, you know, he was kind of a nice guy. He's being persuasive. He, he's a, he's a, a businessman. I mean, he says he's a businessman at one point during the episode. But as soon as Kirk defies him, he puts his foot down and his temper flares. And he's like, I ain't interested in your orders. You're going to give me what I want, or you're going to go back to your ship in a box. So that's where you see how dangerous he is. Because yeah, so, he's a guy used to what he gets once. He basically, gets getting what he wants. What he, and he said, he said, Ed, he said that he gets what he wants. So, you know, I, I thought about it while I was watching the episode. This is not going to be a particularly deep episode, but Steve, I'm really glad you brought up the comparison to a private little war because like a private little war, there is an element of the prime directive that does apply to a piece of the action. So here's my question for both of you. So the, the horizon left behind this book, the book was the cause of the contamination that a hundred years later, it's a planet of gangsters. So even though the horizon didn't deliberately like interfere and change the society, they left behind something that did change the society. So for a hundred years, this planet has been run like Chicago in the 1920s. So here's my question. And Ed, I'm going to start with you on this. Uh -oh. By going down to Sigma Eosia 2 to clean up the contamination, is Kirk interfering with the prime directive? Kirk always interferes with the prime directive. I mean, I, I just watch again. I did a string of episodes, right? I mean, he just did a, a taste of Armageddon. Oh my God, is he interfering with the prime directive? I agree. I but mean, for the sake of this episode, yeah, sure. I'm going to throw to Steve now. Is Kirk interfering with the prime directive? So the explanation he gives is that part of the Federation already messed them up. So we're just trying to fix it. That is the explanation. But yes, of course, of course, he's messing with the prime. Well, this is the thing: is that the prime directive needs to be rewritten. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> and therefore, it's like, you, you, I love that they create, this is the most important rule other than don't go to Talos Four. Definitely don't break this and you have your main character break it consistently. There's a problem with either, there's a problem with the rule or there's a problem with Captain Kirk. Okay, now, now, now this is where, and I, I should have said this at the top of the show, but, but this episode of Enterprise Incidents is our 50th episode of Enterprise Incidents. Congratulations. This is a 
This is a landmark episode, but in the case of this episode, because because the Prime Directive featured so, so heavily in, in quite a few episodes of season two. So it's not a simple answer in the sense that like, yes, I mean, yeah, uh, they, they are definitely interfering with the Prime Directive because it's it's more of a, a, a loaded question because the, the interference already came from the book. So the book influenced the culture. A hundred years later, things are a mess. So Kirk decides we got to go down and we got to fix the problem. But in fixing the problem, he's not like changing the order of society to say, uh, we're, we're going to make it look like, uh, uh, you know, uh, the United States of the 1980s. He's just saying that the contamination left behind by the horizon, we just need to kind of fine tune it. We just need to, to spruce it up to just, you know, uh, oil the machine a little bit so things work a little smoother. So I actually don't think they are interfering with the prime directive. I think they're just trying to clean up a mess that lasted a hundred years, and they're just trying to kind of lock some things into place so it works a little better. So I actually don't think it's a full-on interference with the Prime Directive, but I can see where people do. Ed, what do you think? I was just one thing I was just going to add is they they do it as a joke at the end of the episode where McCoy left his communicator behind. Yeah, right. That's a major thing, though, for a society that is as imitative as they are. And what they've done with radios already to have that future technology in their hands. Well, I don't we'll get to that. that. Exactly. I know we will, but I feel we're talking about prime directive. That to me seems like they should have gone back and gotten the communicator. <laughs> yeah. really. Hey, we, we forgot something. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I actually, I think I completely disagree, Scott, but I'm going to hold my reasoning until we get to the end and can talk okay. about sort of what actually Kirk does. Act two, we come right back where we were. He hands over, one of the henchmen hands over the heater, which is their phaser. He starts to go, well, let's see how this works, which is really, so many people just grab these phasers and just want to shoot them. And Kirk yeah. fortunately stops them and says, don't do that. You could knock out the side of the building. He's like, oh, that good, huh? Just give me a hundred <laughs> of these and we'll have no problem. Thrilled to hear yeah. that, yes. Kalo, take him to the warehouse and put him in a bag. Keep a sharp eye on him, you hear? In the bag, boss, come on. And they take them out, and we leave Oxmix alone. And I love that he looks up as he opens up the communicator, plays around with a little knob, and says, Hey, you, in the ship up there. Scott here. Who's this? Uh, this is Bella Oxmix. I got your captain and his friends down here. If you want to see him alive again, you'll send me down a hundred of these fancy heaters you got and some troops to show me how to use them. I love Scotty throughout this whole episode. Am I to understand that you're holding the captain on this party? He's great. James Doohan is fantastic in this episode. And he, like everybody else, tries to adapt to these people. He tries to speak their lingo. He, he makes it worse than Spock does, but <laughs> it's hysterical. And there's, and by the way, when Oxmix is talking, he's sitting at his desk, and sitting on his desk is one of his, you know, gun mall. And she has the silliest of thigh holsters because it's on her inner thigh, and it's like you wouldn't actually be able to walk <laughs> with that thing. It's a huge gun on her inner thigh. But anyway, I'm going to give you just eight hours to get me the goods I want, or I put the hit on your friends. You understand? I don't know. Here's the funny thing about this. So, so Scotty says, Lieutenant Hadley, check the language banks and find out what a heater is. So this guy is his actor. The actor's name is William Blackburn. And he has been a background player in Star Trek for, for so many episodes. And during the episodes where George Takei was stuck uh, with John Wayne filming the Green Berets, it was uh, William Blackburn who was sitting at the helmsman station. But in this episode, he finally gets a name, and his name is Lieutenant Hadley. So the other thing is that this is what's interesting. The situation that Scotty finds himself in may feel unique to him. But it's actually not unique because Scotty is once again in charge while the landing party is being held hostage. This happened in Bread and Circuses, A Taste of Armageddon, for, uh, a Return of the Archons. I guess it happened there. Definitely Friday's Child. And though they weren't, and, and yes, you could even say they were being held hostage in Metamorphosis. But the way in which Scotty deals with this, again, even though he's not on the planet, Scotty, too, feels like a fish out of water. We're in a warehouse. Our th henchmen are playing cards in the foreground. 
And as soon as I see the cards, I go, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to get to this scene. Um, and we're talking about the fact that this one book caused all of this contamination that they are basically treating it like the Bible. In old Chicago, conventional government almost broke down. The gangs nearly took over. Yeah, well, this ox mix is the worst gangster of all. You have no evidence of who, how bad he is or isn't. Like, all you've seen is you know, just a small moment. It's hard to say he's the worst gangster of all. And Spock, of course, because we're always going to have a little bit of this argument, he says, We may quarrel with Mr. Oxmick's methods, but his goal is essentially the correct one. This society must become united, or it will degenerate into total anarchy. And I wrote, must it? Because there are all sorts of, on our planet right now, we have all sorts of bosses. And you know? look what's happening to our planet. It's devolving into total anarchy. So, so yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we should have one, go I mean, that one boss should take over the world. You know? But but it would certainly, uh, it, it, their reasoning is having one boss would certainly be better than the situation they're in now because, like, I mean. Depends on the boss. Like, we, but with our planet is in total anarchy. No, and it's not, it's not it's, in total It's anarchy. been getting worse. Uh, are you kidding? Uh, from where I've been sitting, our planet has definitely been in total anarchy. No. And it's not getting better. Well, but anyway. Well, this, is not a <laughs> this is not a deep show, so we're not going to go down that path. Yeah, don't make um, me go deep. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. We, and Kirk says, and this goes to your point, Scott. He says, if this society broke down as a result of the horizon's influence, then the Federation is responsible. And we've got to do something to straighten this mess out. Hey, bingo. And we say, well, maybe Spock could go to the sociological computers and find a solution to this, which doesn't sound like a really good plan. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do not have access to my computers, nor are these gentlemen likely to permit it. Well, I've got an idea about that. And he gets up and he walks over. And this is one of my favorite scenes in all of Star Trek. <laughs> this, uh, this card game is a kid's game. You think so, huh? This is such a great scene. Fisbin. Fisbin. What was your take? You know, Ed, like the first time you saw just this scene and more to the point, Shatner's delivery of it. What was your take on that? I mean, I couldn't tell you from the original, but having watched it numerous times over the years, I could say it's almost Looney Tunes. I mean, yes. he gets so oh, good for you. How and wonderful. It's, <laughs> how wonderful for you. That's right. And it's uh, it's so weird and out of character that for a minute you're kind of like, what the hell's going on here? Uh, but at the same time, it's entertaining and it's fun. And you do get little reactions from Spock and McCoy, uh, especially Spock, I think, uh, has sort of just a visual reaction to what he's doing. But it's it's great. It's great fun. But this is the point where the episode really starts to get like moves into more of this silly area. I yeah, think absolutely. Where it's very dramatic. And then suddenly makes that shift and it never quite comes back as serious as I don't think as, as it had been. In that. Well, well, also, also, you know, in this scene, you can tell that, that William Shatner is having a fantastic time. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The scene, filmed, the scene was filmed on day two and a lot of the dialogue was improvised by Shatner. And that is quite obvious yeah. because of the rules that he lays out on uh, Beta Antares 4, they play a real game. It's a man's game, but of course, probably a little beyond you. It requires intelligence. But the three guys, like, it goes over their head, proving Kirk's point <laughs> that these guys, this entire culture, the bosses are morons. <laughs> well, because the it requires intelligence is part of the con, is that he goes, whoa, whoa, I'm smart enough to do this, and that's why he's hanging on every single word. Yeah, I'm familiar with the culture on Beta Antares 4. I don't know of any and Kirk is like, you know, holding his, his head in. Yeah. He's Spock. like, Spock, Spock. <laughs> He's like, this looks like Spock, shut up. <laughs> you know, one of the threads that goes throughout this whole episode is Spock learning how to improvise with Captain Kirk. Is at this moment when he says, hey, there's no game like this. He is out. He is not, he has not learned the basic rule of improv, which is yes and. Yes and means that when the improver says, oh my God, can you believe how big that elephant was? You don't say, there was no elephant. You say, yeah, that was a big elephant. And, and Spock is like 12 feet tall. Huge yeah. Huge elephant. Right. Spock has not learned this yet. The name of the game is called uh, Fisbin. 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 It's uh, not too difficult. Mm -hmm. The other thing I love is there's two ways we've seen Kirk be the trickster over and over and over again. And most of the time, he 100% commits. He is totally sure. 
And in this one, you can see him making things up and not doing the best job. And that is part of what makes it so fun. Each player gets six cards, except for the dealer, uh, the player on the dealer's right, who uh, gets seven. On the right. Yes. The second card is turned up, except on Tuesday. And the guy, what's his name? The one for the opening scene with, you know, uh, Kelso. Kelso. Yeah, right. When he's just like trying his best to keep up, except on Tuesday, right? I mean, when he's he's playing the game and trying to understand what the hell Shatner's talking about, yeah. what Kirk's talking about, and just can't quite get it, but he's doing his best to dance as fast as he can. And I found that to be very humorous. And there's even a contradiction, which I love too, because as he's going through, he goes, oh, you got two jacks. You got a half fizzman already. <laughs> I need another jack. No, no, if you got another jack, why you'd have uh, a shrunk. A shrunk? Yes, you'd be disqualified. Oh. No, what you need now, is either a king and a deuce, except at night, of course, when you need a queen and a and a four. Except at night. <laughs> and then he goes, oh, look, you got another jack, which is what he said would disqualify him. How lucky you are. How wonderful for you. Now, if you didn't get another jack, if you had gotten a king, why then you'd get another card, except when it's dark, when you'd have to give it back. If it were dark on Tuesday. Nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> And then we get the next sort of moment of Spock not quite improvising right. He goes, well, if you got another Jack, that would be a, a royal Fisbin. But the odds of a royal Fisbin, Mr. Spock, what are the odds of getting a royal Fisbin? And now he kind of plays yes and. He says, I've never computed them, Captain. Well, they're astronomical, believe me. Nimoy is just playing just such a great straight man. Yes. And he was he was terrific at it in iMud. He was terrific at it. In, in the trouble with tribbles. Uh, in this case, well, actually in I Mud, he really, you know, plays along towards mm -hmm. the end. And in this in this case, he 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 learns learns the language pretty pretty quickly, not as fast as Kirk, but fast enough. And at this point, our thug, particularly our main guy who's trying to keep up, is completely bewildered. And Kirk drops a card and the guy goes, I'll get it, and then we're gonna wipe him out which they do. I love, by the way, that at the end, after Spock is, you know, giving someone the neck pinch, that he's standing there with a Tommy gun in one hand and a pistol in the other. He looks pretty ready to go. Spock, find the radio station. Uhura's monitoring the broadcasts. Cut in and have yourselves beamed up to the ship. Surely you're coming, Captain. I will, but I'm bringing Bella Ox mix with me. Jim, you can't. Bones, this mess is our responsibility. Have your orders, let's go. And so for the first time in this episode, they have escaped. There's gonna be a lot of getting captured and escaping. Yeah, a lot, a lot of that in this one. And I also love like like how Kirk, Spock, and McCoy they utilize the, the situation to their advantage. Like remember in Bread and Circuses when they were in the cell and it was the three of them and there were three guards and Kirk says three versus three will never get a better chance. Well, in this one they're being helped by three you know gangsters and it was three versus three and it was a different situation instead of like McCoy faking getting sick. You know, Kirk comes up with Fizbin, which is a far more fun uh, mm -hmm. way to do it. It's also a far more convoluted way to do it, but it worked because of the tone of the episode. Doesn't Spock do a lot of nerve pinching in this episode? Because there's a point yes, several. He does. Yeah. And McCoy says, you know, you're very good at that. <laughs> yeah, he did it this. He's going to do it in the, the next radio. Scene. Yeah. He does it again uh, uh, in the next act uh, with the uh, the hit on uh, Krakow's office. So anyway, yeah, you're right. It's You're a lot absolutely of them. right. Um, Which is part of the problem that Spock developed, remember, because he could get them out of any situation. Oh, let me provide a nerve pinch and we're done. We're out. FSNP, as they call it in the script. <laughs> right. Scott, you are far more knowledgeable in this area than I am. And Ed, maybe you are too. Has there someone's has to have made a Fizbin game, right? Oh, Someone, well, oh. they didn't they use Fizbin on one of the other uh, uh Deep Space Nine re uh, revive uh, definitely uh, has been mentioned. Did they play it or they reference it. I don't remember. Yeah, they do reference it. They I reference think, yeah. it. I think you're so, right. I forgot about that. No one has created a Star Trek fan Fizbin game somewhere. I well, how well, do you? Well, it makes no sense. <laughs> in in one of the Star Trek poster books, there was a tw uh, a series of seventeen poster books yeah. uh, from like 1976 to 1978, and one of them uh, actually had an article on how to play Fizbin, hmm. but it was not 
meant to be taken seriously because it's just as confusing as Kirk's description mm -hmm. uh, from just a few moments ago. <laughs> exactly. So speaking of escaping and getting captured, Kirk is running down the alleyway and immediately <laughs> another p people grab him. Okay, Pally, we're going for a ride. If you don't mind, I'd rather walk. Listen, Pally, this could either be a taxi or a hearse. You know what I mean? I'm beginning to get the idea. The car pulls up and Kirk gets in. So he is captured for the second time. <laughs> and we cut to a woman playing a record. Spock and McCoy enter behind her. Here's our next uh, neck pinch. You do that very well. Now, how are you with primitive radio equipment? And Spock very confidently says he knows exactly how to do it. He does something, flips a switch, and we hear a really funny commercial. Brought to you by Bang Bang, the makers of the sweetest little automatic in the world. Okay, so that voice that you hear uh, uh, introducing the jailbreakers with their latest record, uh, that voice is James Dewan. Oh, I never knew that. Oh, cool. Enterprise, this is Mr. Spock. Lieutenant Uhura here, Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock, what are you doing on this frequency? A very long and complicated story, Lieutenant. Notify the transporter room two to beam up these coordinates. And the car that Kirk is in pulls up to another building, and we see a sign that says, Krakow, boss, south side. What I love, by the way, is that Oxmix is the largest, you know, the most powerful boss in the world, and Krakow is the second most powerful, and they're like two blocks away from each other, and yeah, that essentially the world is like a, like one neighborhood, you know? It's a back lot, <laughs> that's yeah. what it is. <laughs> exactly. And we cut to Krakow, Vic Tabak. Vic Tabak, who of course is best known for playing Mel Sharples on the hit sitcom series, Alice, between 1976 and 1985. He's an Emmy nominee for playing Mel. And he also played Mel in the film that this was based on, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Uh, on TV, he was on The Lieutenant, again, another uh, Roddenberry show, Get Smart, Mission Impossible, Bewitched, The Partridge Family, and The Love Boat. And get this, he did four episodes of a short-lived series called con and mm. what's notable wasn't that con <laughs> it, well, well it wasn't that con but what's notable about the name of the show is that it is con with an exclamation point hmm. so if you're going to read the name of the series it's con <laughs> <laughs> i think you're funny. extrapolating there a little bit but okay I'll yeah, go. a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> that's what we do on enterprise right, incidents good. He's so great at this. And as you said, uh, if if Bella is one perfect version of a crime boss, this is another perfect version, a different yep. kind of a crime boss. And if we didn't know that this episode was going to be silly, he is trying to throw a dart over his shoulder into a huge poster of Bella Oxmix with targets on his face. We've reached a new level of silliness. But Dick Tayback is so great. I mean, like, like Anthony Caruso is is over the top. In, in a great way, in his way. And Vic Tabak is over the top in a great way, in his way. And yeah. they're both equally great. Tabak and Caruso are equally fantastic. So you're the Fed, huh? Well, 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 well. And you? Krakow, Jojo Krakow. I'm the head of the whole South Side Territory. <laughs> and I love that Kirk essentially cuts to the chase and says, You want to make a deal? Hey, I like that. That's sharp, as I both. Sharp, boss. And I love, too, that Krakow has sent over his woman to massage Kirk's shoulders to sort of sweeten the deal a little bit, I guess. <laughs> I'm a reasonable man. You give me what I want, and I'll cut you in for, say, uh, a third. Which, by the way, they're... A they, third of what? <laughs> and these seem like big deals. Like, a third of everything oh, you yeah. get? That's a lot. I got a better idea. And he pitches Uniting the Planet. And you should get together and talk about it and come up with an agreement. You watch it, Kirk. The book tells us how to handle things. You make hits. Somebody argues you lean on them. What do you think, we're stupid or something? And Kirk says, and this is, they're reaching for this joke, but yeah. Kirk's reaction to it is so funny, it's worth it. Oh, no, no, I don't think you're stupid, Mr. Krakow. I just think your behavior is arrested. I've never been arrested my whole life. <laughs> it's so great. And the way the way that that Tayback like he screams, I've never been arrested in my life, and he like really goes off on on Kirk, 
and Shatner's like responses, like he's trying to get a word in edgewise and he just can't by this point. Sh- Shatner has so many great reaction shots and this moment is one of them. Um, by the way, who would arrest him? There's no government. <laughs> There's no, we don't see he's never police. been arrested in his life. Yeah. <laughs> you want to live, don't you, Kirk? You bet you do. But after I get through with you, you're liable to be sorry unless you come across. Again, Kirk refuses. It's literally exactly the same scene as we had with Oxmex. Threats, he refuses. So we're going to take Kirk away and put him on ice. And we cut to him sitting in this room and he's looking around for something to use as a weapon. By the way, there's a letter opener sitting right on the desk. And I'm like, you don't leave a sharp, knifey kind of thing in with your prisoner. <laughs> this seems kind of right. dumb, but that's not what he goes for. And says he sees the big old-fashioned radio, turns it over, rips off the back, pulls something out of it that might be a transformer or something. And we go, okay, Kirk's got a plan. Always has a plan because he's observing. Back on the Enterprise, they I guess they asked the computer, hey, what do you do if you have a society created by Chicago gangsters? Because I mean, well, how do we fix that? And the computer apparently doesn't have an answer. And then Oxmix calls. I tell you, you better come on back down. Krakos, put the bag on your captain. Why would he put a bag on our captain? Kidnapped him, you dope. And I got to say, Spock is really dumb here. (laughs) Because Oxmix (laughs) says, come on down, you can totally trust me. I'm afraid I find it difficult to trust you, Mr. Oxmix. What's to trust? Business is business. We'll call a truce. Spock goes, I guess I got to trust him. And McCoy... It's like, you're going to trust him? If we are to save the captain without blatant, forceful interference on this planet, Doctor, we must have the assistance of someone indigenous. We are therefore forced to trust Mr. Oxmex. It's not the smartest of Spock moves. No. And then we cut to Kirk. He's now got a wire that he's putting across the door to trip people. And then he throws down a garbage can, yells, Help me! Help! Help me! First guy runs in, falls. Second guy runs in. Kirk takes him out. I love that he throws a blanket over a dude's head and just spins him around in circles. Like, you know, like you're playing pin the tail on the donkey or something and then knocks him out. And that's where we get the music, the music that's, cue thing where it gets silly. You know, yeah. The, the, well, yeah. That, that silly music cue is coming from the trouble with tribbles. Right. No, mm-hmm. I think that I guess, you know, since they were using tracked, uh, uh, tracked music uh, from other episodes, it, 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 given the tone of this episode, it was the it, it fit the most. But I see what you're saying. Yeah, the the, uh, the silly music does you know take away from some of the uh, suspense. But I don't know if suspense is the uh, name of the game here. You know what? Now, now that you're saying it, it, I didn't bump on it before, but I actually totally agree with you. And I think the silly because I can picture, I can hear the music, and I can picture the bartender um, stack pulling out tribbles, and it's really funny. It works really well for that bit. And but for the fight scene, this but not as well for this bit. Because you still want to, you're still in a situation where you want to still create, even though there's humor, you want to create some tension. And when you do things like that, it's really like winking at the audience. Like, we're having fun here, guys. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it should be a little more serious, I think. But uh, but this is Kirk's now second escape. We're in the transporter room, and the one instruction he gives to Scotty that is smart is to have our phasers ready on stun. Now you're beginning to make sense. Back in Oxmix's office, he tells the... His henchmen, you know what to do, and they say, don't worry, boss, they can't do nothing until they stop sparkling. They beam down, and they have their guns on them again. This is a third capture, and that is the end of Act 2. Yeah, you're right. I never noticed how many captures there are, but in this case, you know, Spock and McCoy just fell for the oldest trick in the book. The other thing is, though, by the time you have this other capture and the taking of the phase, he goes, you know, a couple more visits like this, I won't even need you to do what I Yep. Because I'm getting everything I want anyway. So that's true. Uh, that's a found very funny line. I understood we had an arrangement, a truce. I was hoping you'd think that, dummy. Ouch. There's something so great about calling the smartest person, you know, one of the smartest people there is, dummy. Yep. <laughs> right after Oxmix calls Spock dummy, uh, he says the line, Nobody helps nobody but himself. And Spock Sir. corrects him. Sir, you are employing a double negative. And then Oxmix's response to that is, huh? <laughs> so who's the <laughs> dummy here? <laughs> right, exactly. Spock, it is way dumber to, for him to beam down than to employ a, dumb, a double negative. Absolutely. I'm going to say Spock wins on that one. You yourself have stated the need for unity of authority on this planet. We agree. Yeah, but I got to be the unity. Cooperation, sir, would inevitably result. The most cooperative man in this world is a dead man. And I love this, another great gangster line. 
And if you don't keep your mouth shut, you're going to be cooperating. Very good. It's a great line. And then in comes Kirk. This is now another escape. Like we've now, we just got captured again. Now we're free again. You got away from Crackle. You know that ain't easy. Find out anything from the computer? Nothing useful. Logic and practical information do not seem to apply here. <laughs> McCoy's response is great. He goes, you admit that? <laughs> Den- deny the fact would be illogical. There you go. Then you don't mind if I play a hunch. Spock's reply again. This is, this, it's just so fun. I'm not sanguine about hunches, Captain, but I have no practical alternative. What, what's also funny, too, is that we see Spock go from totally not being able to improvise to kind of being into it at the end. And then, but we also watch Kirk really get into it. I mean, see, he's, now, now, yeah. He, go ahead. Here's the thing. So, so we just, we just a couple, a few episodes ago during our deep dive of obsession talked about how intuition is such an essential trait of being a starship captain. So Kirk is going to play a hunch using his intuition in a very different setting, but it is still using the intuition that has served him so very well. And for the rest of this episode, he is really going to say that if you can't beat him, join him. And by joining him, that's how we'll sort of beat them. Well, now that we have Bella, I'm going to put the bag on Krakow. And he goes to one of the thugs and goes, now listen, you. Say, that's nice material. It ought to be. It cost a bundle. Get out of them. Hey. I said. Just a minute. You too. Um, And the guys start to take out their clothes. Nobody's going to put the bag on me anymore. Uh, Which actually isn't true. (laughs) He's going to get the bag. funny. He starts adopting the gangster lingo, basically, Mm -hmm. and changing his speaking. But nobody notices. I mean, the gangsters don't notice that suddenly this guy who is speaking so formal is suddenly saying, hey, you guys over there, you got to come over here and do this and do that. Nobody notices. Nobody comments. Nobody- like, like, you know what, Ed? Like, like, as the episode progresses, you see the evolution of Kirk's, especially Kirk's transformation from being such a formal Starfleet officer from the Federation to, to be, you know, turning full gangster, yeah. literally. Uh, it's it's just it's it's just one of the reasons that Shatner is a genius. Oh, absolutely! It's great to fun to watch. It just it just cracks me up that nobody suddenly noticed that he's talking like them. Uh, yeah, you know. Well, he's slowly starting to speak better English. Yeah, he was speaking very poor English when That's they first right. beamed down, and now his grammar is improving. There's a big music sting, and we come back, and the guys are in their long underwear. And I wrote this note at this cut. I wrote, I just love this episode. <laughs> <laughs> they head out. They get in the car. Wheels, Mr. Spock. A flipper, Captain. And Kirk looks around, keys in the ignition, starts it, tries to put it in gear, strips the gear. Oops, gears. Yes. Oh, I believe they had a device known as a, a, a clutch. I, I wonder if this is a Shatner improv line. I kind of like this. I'm going to get one myself. <laughs> he gestures to go forward, and the car goes into reverse, and they drive off, pop, you know, the clutch, the gears popping, and backfiring as they drive away this is hilarious this is hilarious i mean here you have this this you know kirk and spock who who just you know figured out how to defeat the doomsday machine and you know we're in the mirror universe and now they're trying to drive like and and kirk can't even drive a a car it's just so funny it's so fun i i think there's a direct connection between this and city on the edge of forever because even though city on the edge of forever is a heavy episode it's also kirk and spock trapped in another time and they're really funny together there are many funny moments in that of the two of them together and this is going okay let's just take that part and leave apart, leave away all the serious stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they arrive at Krakow's headquarters. The door is guarded. The, you know, one more backfire as they stop, and Spock turns to him and says, Captain, you are an excellent starship commander, but as a taxi driver, you leave much to be desired. It was that bad. <laughs> That's great. It's great. And we see uh, this kid is kind of playing around. And they see the guards, you know, inspecting every baby carriage that goes by. And they go and say, they don't look like the trusting type. And then up comes the kid. The kid is Sheldon Collins, and he is terrific in this scene. You're going to hit somebody. Can I watch? And the first they're treating him again with that formal language. Young man, run along and play. Where'd you get them ears? Young man. You're going to hit Crackle? Out here? You open up and you'll be scrapped from every window on the street. I can fix it for you. 
And again, it's another really fun moment because Spock is saying, go away, this is too dangerous. And he says, hold on, Spock. Out of the mouth of babes. Who are you calling a babe? I'm calling you a babe. You calling me a babe? Yeah, I'm calling. The kid holds up a knife to Captain Kirk. I'm calling you a babe, but there's nothing personal. Sit down. They sit down. He, they say, you can get us closer. And he goes, yeah, what's in it for me? What do you want? A piece of the action. I know I've said in general, I don't like people saying the names of titles in their episodes. I love this one. Absolutely yeah. great. Because it fit because sometimes it's like they're trying to find a way to fit the title into the episode. Yeah. This one, it flows perfectly correct. And they say, You do not even know what the action is going to be. I figure it's gotta be a thick percentage, or you wouldn't be trying to hit crackle. <laughs> I, I love that that Spock, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, the, the the kid is really smart. And yeah. it's Spock nods his head because logical <laughs> like <Yeah>. he's impressed <laughs> all right young man we'll guarantee you a piece of the action if we can pull this thing off is that a contract done and they shake it's great um by the way does this kid get a piece of the action i mean he helped them pull it off that was the piece of the action he got a very small i mean a school he just literally small. got a piece of the action, uh, and Shatner or Kirk calls him on it, right? I would not calls him on it, but it looks like a piece of the action. Like, you got it. <laughs> you got it. There you go. I think a that piece of the, the action. action means whatever money you're going to make, he should get some of. <laughs> That's what a piece of oh, the action God, he means. He literally got a piece of the action. Literally yeah. the action, I, right. I think the Federation ripped him off. The Federation took 40%. <laughs> this kid should have gotten 1% of that. You know 40%. what? You're right. That's what I think. You're right. Um, because without him, we don't succeed. He, well, don't don't be surprised if they don't make a whole new uh, Star Trek series out of that. There you yeah, go. They do it for everything um, else these days, so why not? <laughs> so the kid is playing around, plays on the steps. The guards think he's kind of cute, and then he falls down and says, "Daddy, Daddy, I hurt myself." And they go, "That's our cue." And they Ew. yeah, they run up. Wait a moment. What have they done? What have they done to you? What have you done? And then they take the guards out. And then once inside, they can use their phasers to take out some other guys. And then we hear, after they've taken out those guys. Well, ain't this nice. I was wondering how I was going to get you back and hear you deliver yourself. And we hear, click. Captain, I believe that perhaps it would be wise to do as he says. I just heard the sound of... The sound of a machine gun bolt being pulled back. So, once again, Steve... They're captured. <laughs> it's like, I, I actually lost, I th is it the fourth time? It's the drinking it's the game, I'm telling you. They're captured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There's, a, there's the drinking game. How many they drink every time somebody gets captured in a piece of the action? And that is the end of act three. We come back and now it's Krako playing with the phaser. So this is a fancy heater, huh? How's it work? And then again, Kirk plays another good game. Can you trust your men? Of course I can. Well, one of these can make a man a pretty big boss, you know. I either trust them or they're dead. And then Krakow looks around and goes, let's go talk over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Great. yeah. By the way, my assumption is that this set and the uh, Oxmix office set are pretty much the same set that they just read. I'm glad that you brought that up because actually, actually, Steve and Ed, Bella Oxmix's office was on stage 10. Hmm. Jojo Krakow's office was on stage 11. Oh, interesting. So they were so not they on different. the same set. They were actually different sets. And I had that in my notes, but I forgot to mention that. So, Steve, well, thank welcome. you for for uh, for tipping me off. All right, Krakow, we don't have time to show you how to play with toys. Toys. And then Kirk just takes the phaser back. <laughs> like, puts it in his pocket. <laughs> like, crack up, like, he's been so careful all this whole time, and he just lets Kirk take a weapon out of his hand for no reason whatsoever. What do you think we're here for? To get a cut of your deal? Forget it. That's peanuts to an outfit like the uh, Federation. Right? Unquestionably. Right? Right. right. <laughs> so that is the first time that Spock is starting to get on this yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah and this is where Shatner is really starting to gangster it up oh uh, look Cracko we're taking over the uh, whole ball of wax and you cooperate with us and uh, maybe we'll cut you in for a piece of the action Spock says a minuscule a very small piece thought you guys had laws no interference who's interfering we're 
Taken over. Check. Right. <laughs> and then Kirk just like waves them off, yeah. you know, because he's still not getting it. But but this is what I mean. Like the the you know uh, like Krakow brings up. I thought you guys couldn't interfere. Well, the interference already happened because of the book. It's like Kirk is saying, okay, yeah, you imitated the book, but you you just you just need just a little help, just bringing it all together, just roughing out the smoothing out the edges, and that's that's where I think that it's actually. Not he's not violating the prime directive because he's not saying he's not telling them that like you guys are getting it all wrong by being gangsters. You want to be gangsters, fine. Just unite, work together, do your thing, but just you just need a little help, and that's what we're here to do. So he's saying that there's no problem with the thing that they got from the horizon, the contamination, but he does want to change their whole governmental structure. Well, he's they don't have a governmental structure. He's they do. Them. They do. They have separate countries, each one run by a boss. Those are governments. People okay, pay taxes. Right. They get services. I mean, the uh, planet is being taken over by the Federation, but we don't want to come in here and uh, use our muscle. You know what I mean? Uh, that ain't uh, subtle. So what we do is we we help one guy take over the planet. He pulls the strings, and then we pull his. <laughs> By the way, there's such a, a Carol O'Connor uh, Archie Bunkerness to some of his deliveries in this, I think. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, sure. And, and he sits down in the chair and tells Spock to put the, to sit down. Spock puts the phaser in his pocket. He sits down, and it's just so fun to watch Kirk put his feet on the desk, and then Spock looks over, sees Kirk does that, and Mr. Spock puts his feet up on the desk. Shatner is, at this point of this episode, Shatner is having so much fun. He's really into it. And just like we've seen him do, obviously in Trouble with Tribbles, obviously in I Mud, and even in like Tomorrow is Yesterday, he's great at the comedy. He is. Absolutely. What you also get in this too, which is that you're talking before, Steve, about the whole, you know, check, right, you know, whatever. Uh, everything between Shatner and Nimoy in this, I keep thinking for some reason when I was watching the episode of Star Trek Four. And the moments totally. of the voyage home with the. You guys like Italian? No. Yes. Yeah, no. no. Yes. No. Yes. I love Italian. And so do you. Yes. Great. Or when he says, you shouldn't curse Sp Spock. Why? You know, th those four letter words, it's swearing. You shouldn't do it. Why? I don't think you've got the hang of it. That <laughs> kind of rapport between the two of them. Yes. To be translated 20 years later in the voyage home is like shocking to me how good it is and how real it is. And it just taps into the natural chemistry again between these two guys. That is a really, really great point, Ed. And what's amazing is that this episode and that movie were shot, uh, let's see, 1967 to 1986. Uh, you know, th 19 that's years. Yeah. 19 years. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> math is not my strong point. Um, but uh, it's amazing how the chemistry just didn't skip a beat at all. It was right. It was still there. And they went 10 That's years why. without working with each other and they yeah. still had it. You know, it's just amazing. Yep. Well, right. and, and their period pieces. Yeah. This city on the edge of forever and voyage home are all period pieces. They're all fish out of water things. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely connections there. All right, Scotty. Uh, we made a deal with Krakow. And again, you just watched James doing his react, trying to figure all this out. Do you think that's wise, sir? Sure, we can trust Krakow, but we don't have any choice, you know what I mean? He's standing about 12 feet in front of me, all ready to be our pal. Of course, uh, Scotty, I'd like to show him the ship, just to, to show him that we're, uh, we're on the level. And it's Scotty and Ahura in a two-shot. And you see Uhura gets it first, and then Scotty's like, oh, I get what we're doing. I do indeed, yes. And, and you know what it is? Uh, whatever the regulation is from Wrath of Khan that no uncoded messages, hours should seem like days, that's what he's sending. He's sending a coded message. Yeah. Absolutely. You're right. You're, you've are you just in like a, a, a two-minute uh, period here on Enterprise Incidents linked a piece of the action to Star Trek four and Star Trek two. And to that gentlemen, I salute you. We're amazing. What can I say? Yeah, it's good stuff. Scotty, we'll uh, need uh, phasers uh, to equip uh, everyone at Krakow's man. We'll need advisors and troops to back him up on the hit. You got all that, uh, Scotty? <laughs> uh, and bye-bye, Mr. Krakow. I just want the look on his face, the look on Krakow's face while he's being beamed up. 
you know, you know, he's not going to be a happy camper when he gets to the other side. Right. And he's not. (laughs) And then for no reason whatsoever, Kirk and Spock beat up or take out the other guys. And it's like, you have phasers. You could have just stunned them. (laughs) Like why actually go hand to hand, but that's what they do. And now they have been captured and escaped again. Um, and we're on the Enterprise, and there is Krakow going, how did I get here? It looks like we put the bag on you, doesn't it? I got rights! You got nothing. And this, again, it's a very silly, very fun scene watching Scotty try to use the lingo. You mind your place, mister, or you'll... And he's so happy to have come up with this term. You'll be wearing concrete galoshes. <laughs> That's an A for effort. Yeah, absolutely, he does. <laughs> But he's a little he's a little off, and then uh, Krakow corrects him and says, "You mean cement overshoes?" And he's S- Scotty's a little embarrassed, and he goes, "I." <laughs> <laughs> They're outside, heading to the car, and Spock says, "Must we?" It's faster than walking, but not as safe. Are you afraid of cars? Not at all, Captain. It's your driving that alarms me. Spock, I've got the hang of it. Why not go on? <laughs> it's crazy. I, I, this is the most um, giving his commander. Some throwing some shade on Captain Kirk that Spock has ever done. I mean, he really is is making fun of his driving. And now Krakow's guys wake up and realize that Krakow is gone and it must have something to do with Oxmix, so they're going to put a hit on his place. Um, back at Oxmix's, McCoy, looking really not very threatening with a Tommy gun, is starting yeah, to worry about yeah. where they are. Knowing Krakow, he'll probably send them back on a blotter. Wrong again, Oxmix. And now Kirk's going to be full on. He's not, he's not messing around at all anymore. Now listen, I'm getting tired of playing panic cake with you penny ante operators. What do you mean a penny ante operator? You're a penny ante operator. Sit down. All right, Spock, I'll cover him. Is Hawaii Five O on right now with Bookham Dano? Uh, 68 it started. I am so impressed, Scott, that you actually, and I, and I 100% believe that you're right. I, yes. that is an incredible, I knew, I mean, if it was a Star Trek question, I knew you would have the answer or a Beatles question, but having the, the premiere of Hawaii Five O in your head, that is impressive. <laughs> hey, I knew it um, too. I just didn't say it fast enough. Okay. I'm impressed. Ed, I'm just as impressed with both of you. Thank you so much. Um, I did not know it whatsoever. Now listen, sweetheart, the Federation's moving in. We're taking over. You play ball, we'll cut you in for a piece of the pie. You don't, you're out. All the way out. You know what I mean? You know what, what I mean? mean. <laughs> what I wonder is how many gangster movies did Kirk see? He must have been renting a lot of Bogart and Cagney and those movies to be able to do this. There was no money. Or he either back when he was at the Academy and, you know, they had movie night. Yeah. Or because he is, he, he just is uh, so good at observing, just picked up on everything mighty fast. You got crack on ice? Uh, he's here. Mad enough to chew neutronium, but behaving himself. Okay, baby, cool him until I flag him. Flag me? And we have a couple <laughs> of these where then he has to translate himself. Keep him there until I send for him. We're going to make some old-style phone calls from this locale. So you uh, locate the man on the other end of the blower and give him a ride to this flop. What? <laughs> then he translates again. <laughs> Find the man at the other end of the phone and transport him to these coordinates. Can't do, sweetheart. Can do, Captain. It's it's so funny. It's just because uh, all I want to say is it, this is so funny, and this one's really funny, and I love this moment. And this, I, this is not insightful criticism or or deep analysis. This is just me being a fan for for yes. a lot of this. Well, stuff. this is what's great yeah. about it is that it's a great it's a great episode to be a fan of. But Shatner totally. always always enjoyed, I think, or he really embraced it as the years went on, uh, making fun of his own image and having those moments where. He could, I mean, think of Enterprise, I mean, Enterprise Incidents, that's your show. Uh, think of a free enterprise where it's funny. Free enterprise. Or Airplane 2, right? Where he's like, that's the sure. ironic thing about irony. It's so ironic. <laughs> it's, but it's just like, he loves those moments where he gets to make fun of himself. And I think in this, or, or just have fun with it. You, you know what's so weird about that? And it never occurred to me until this moment is that's totally true. It's, he absolutely loves you know, taking the air out of his own image. And yet all we've heard about during the shooting the show was how controlling and um, anxious he was about maintain, about what Captain Kirk was like, you know, like he wanted to make sure he had the most lines. He wanted to make sure he had the most camera time. He's like, so we heard about this big ego, yet that didn't apply to him 
making fun of himself. You know what I mean? And there's also a re relaxation. Like if you compare the stories that Norman Spinrad told about Doomsday Machine and where she was counting those lines and, and really yeah. and all that. And you get flash forward to season two where you're in the middle of it and you look at an episode like a string of episodes around this time, but a piece of the action. And he seems much more relaxed and much more. And I don't know if that's true or not, but you can see that sort of edge that you could sense on screen a lot of times. You didn't feel quite as much. It was almost as if he'd come to some sort of peace of uh, where he was at. I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, I, I completely agree with that. It's really, it's really interesting. He is a, he is a truly fascinatingly complicated person. Yeah. Shatner. <laughs> so we have Oxmix make some phone calls and he's calling one of the other bosses. Lock in and energize. Yeah, you bet your life I got a lot of nerve. What are you going to do about it? Coming over there with a couple of my boys and we're... There he is holding a non-existent phone, which for some reason did not beam over with yeah, him when the rest of him beamed over. So that's the other crime boss, Teppo, played by John Harmon, who might be familiar to Checkers because he was he was Roden, the bum from City on the Edge of Forever, who picks up Dr. McCoy's phaser, zaps himself into oblivion. Um, apparently he zapped himself to this planet and became a crime boss here. Yeah. Um, where once again, he's run afoul of, of technology he doesn't understand because he goes, Mother. That phaser will travel. <laughs> that phaser will travel. <laughs> um, and then this is the moment. Hey, Captain, that ain't fair. Yeah. I would advise you to keep dialing, Oxmix. So Spock is now in on the action. Yep. And that's a great line. And Nimoy is awesome. I wonder what Nimoy thought when he got that in the script. Did, I wonder if he resisted it or embraced it. Because it, it could have been either way. Oh. Uh, I think you know because of because of Tribbles and because of I Mud, uh, and mm. this this comes along. I I think he was. I would guess you know. Of course, I don't know, but uh, I would guess by this point because he had done the comedy a couple times already that he embraced it. But at the same time, what I do know from what I read is when they did start doing those full on comedies like I Mud and Trouble Tribbles, that Nimoy and Bob Justman were two of the principals of Star Trek who were opposed to it. Right. Uh, whereas like m most of the other players, especially Shatner were like, yeah, this is great. Let's do it. But, but for this one, I, I mean, you know, Nimoy was, was awesome in this. Cause he's still That's Spock. Awesome. It goes back to that point. Yeah. He's still being Spock just, and a Spock who's trying to adapt and failing miserably doing so. And that's what makes it so great. Yep. We cut to a huge crowd of bosses, including Krakow who's back. And they're all arguing amongst themselves. All right, all right, all right, all right. And there is Kirk walking on the pool table. Now the Federation's taking over, whether you like it or not. You people, you've been running this planet like a piecework factory. From now on, it's going to be under one roof. You're going to run it like a like a business, and that means. You're going to make a profit. Yeah. And when they ask what his percentage is, he says 40%. That is so, I mean, can you imagine if someone said, I'm going to take 40% of the budget of the federal government? Right, exactly. <laughs> like, that's a lot. They don't seem to mind. They're like, okay, no, that's, that's reasonable. And, <laughs> but then this is the argument. All we've seen is a few guys. So maybe, you know, how do we know that you're so powerful? Listen, they got a ship. I know I was there. So at this moment, he is on the, they are powerful. I've seen it. And they keep arguing. They argue with Krakow. And then Krakow interrupts. Hang on a minute. I only saw three guys in that ship. Maybe there ain't no more. And, and Kirk uh, leans down to him, points his gun at his face and says, there are over 400 guys there. You know the other person who I really see, and I see this in Kirk several times, there's a very Brando-ish element about the way Kirk does this performance. There's a very, it's kind of the tone of voice and some of the facial expressions and moves feels like he's a little Brando-ish. Maybe, yeah. No, that's a good observation. And in the middle of this conversation, a whole bunch of cars pull up because the hit from Krakow's men are coming. And Krakow's thrilled. Hey, it's my boys that are making the hit at this place. My boys will put you down. What a bet. And they all go to the window. And as they go to the window, McCoy goes to the window too. And they grab him again. Another capture in this episode. Another capture. Take a drink. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. 
Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Get that heater down. Don't you want to take a look at what you're going to fight? And at this point, they think he's they think he's really bluffing. I already seen it. You're nothing, Fred. All right, but at least let me call my ship one last time and say goodbye. Which is so dumb. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that they yeah, let that him use that, that communicator when they've seen what the communicator can do. Even re-watching it now, yesterday when I was re-watching, I was just like, no. <laughs> that makes no sense. I always loved this scene because here you have... Uh, Krakow's men doing a hit on Bella's office. And once again, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are being held hostage. And Kirk calls up. And, and what's great about this moment is like in this scene, this entire time, you know, Kirk is very much in character of the gangster. But now they're hostages again. And here's this hit that's happening. And Kirk has the communicator. And he only knows he has a second before Krakow takes the communicator back, like a light switch. He goes right back to Captain James T. Kirk of the Enterprise, and he says, Put the ship's phases on stun. First time and only time that happened. Fire a burst in a one-block radius around these coordinates. Right away, sir. And you still see the hit going on for another second, and then you see the phasers and everybody falls down at once. And what I love about this moment is without actually seeing the Enterprise, you see the power of the Federation. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a great moment. It and is. they, and it works. They all go, Oh, that's some know. trick. Yeah. That's some trick. <laughs> and that thing you said before, Scott, a minute ago, Scott, about, about him, suddenly he switches and he's back to being Captain Kirk again. And I think yep. you and I have talked about this in the past. Like it's that it reminds me of that moment in deadly years, right? He's an old man, old man. He gets his shot. He shows up on the bridge and it's magic watching him yep. be Kirk again, snap right back into per- per- Kirk persona. Absolutely. Great point. Absolutely. Great that episode, point. just like this, written by David Harmon. Yeah. Yep. Oh, good point. Hey, did you see that? They're not dead, just knocked out for a while. But they might just as well have been that way if we wanted them to. And at this point, they say, okay, we got the message. So what's the deal you're talking about? <laughs> We're ready to talk. <laughs> We're ready to talk. <laughs> okay. A syndicate makes sense to me. I'm a peaceful man at heart, but I'm sick and tired of all these hits. I hit Krako, Krako hits Teppo, Teppo hits me. There's too many bosses. We can't get anything done. What's interesting to me is they really are governments. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, they are actually working governments in their own way. I was thinking, if there was just one, maybe somebody like you as the top boss, then we can get things done. Hey, Bella. (laughs) No, 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 no. The Federation can't get connected with a small-time operation like this. Now, I was thinking, uh, Bella, you would be the top boss. Cracko, you'd be his lieutenant. The rest of you, I don't want any trouble from the rest of you, because you'll have to answer to the Federation. And then they, they're so scared, they say, you think maybe 40% is enough? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, they're ready to give him more. Yeah, Reasonable, right, Mr. Oxmix. Yeah. Let's break out some of your drinking stuff and celebrate the syndicate. I want to now answer the question of why I do think this is interference. Okay. Because what he just did is having met a guy for like an hour, he made him the king of the world, met another guy for very little time, both of whom are known criminals and killers. He made him the second in command. And then he told a whole bunch of governments to shut up. <laughs> like he, that is interference. He created a world government with almost no time that is totally changing the course of this, this world forever. So I think it's an interference. Okay, I see your point. But he always, like I said earlier, he always interferes. Of course he does, yeah. (laughs) Constantly. Gentlemen, you two have been brooding ever since we returned to the ship. Brooding, Captain? Brooding, Mr. Spock, a somber emotional state. Now, do you wish to continue it? Or are you going to discuss it? And I like that he, the first thing he says is, but I do have reservations about your solution to the problem of the Ioceans. Ah, yes. I understand that. You don't think it's logical to leave a criminal organization in charge. Highly irregular, to say the least, Captain. (laughs) And then the next one is even better, and I love that Kirk hasn't even thought about it. How are you going to explain the 40% that we're collecting every year? Yes, that's a very good question, Mr. Spock. I propose that our cut be put into the planetary treasury and used to guide the Ioceans into a more ethical system. Despite themselves, they'll be forced to accept conventional responsibilities. Isn't that logical? McCoy is still brooding. 
And again, it's, uh, you know, I could say all the lines, but it's really just fun watching them get the information out of McCoy, which, Ed, you mentioned earlier, is that he left the communicator on the planet. Right. And that's bad news. <laughs> that's really bad news. You that really think it's such serious? Phases. Serious. Serious, Bones. It upsets the whole percentage. How do you mean? Well, in a few years, the Ioceans may demand a piece of our action. And then the episode ends on a freeze frame. You have this really uplifting music as the Enterprise goes off into deep space. And so the thing with the translator being left behind, or the communicator being left behind on Sigma Eoshia 2. So back in the 90s, when the uh, uh, writers and producers of Deep Space Nine were trying to come up with a 30th anniversary of Star Trek celebration episode before they chose to go in the direction of trials and tribulations which i think is a brilliant totally fun episode and honestly steve i feel like we should cover that on enterprise incidents as a bonus but originally the plan was for the federation i guess the defiant from the space nine to go to sigma eoshia 2 and this is now 100 years later and because mccoy left behind his communicator Instead of being a planet of gangsters, Sigma Eoshia 2 is now a planet of people walking around in Federation uniforms from the original series. Yeah, you know, the technology, uh, the sets are inspired by the sets of the original series Enterprise. I guess, but for whatever reason, they decided that, that the triples factor, because the triples are so iconic, they went with trials and tribulations mm. instead, but that would have been pretty fun. It was going to be a commentary on the fan, the, the whole fan movement thing, the whole idea of a planet of Star Trek fans, essentially. <laughs> oh, that was the idea. That they didn't oh, that about. would have been awesome. Yeah. I never, that yeah, I never heard this before. I, I think it's a really funny idea. Yeah. 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 That brings us to the end of the show. Scott, what did people have to say about this episode? Well, we're going to hear a lot about what James Comack had to say in just a moment, but Robert Justman Robert Justman, who I mentioned before, was opposed to the the, the comedic uh, direction that the series was taken for a little bit there, said, I fought against that one perhaps more so than any other episode we did. I could not understand why Gene Kuhn wanted that story, but I must admit he pulled it off with the humor he added, and Gene Roddenberry allowed him to do so. I will not try to explain that. It will have to remain a mystery for you hmm. as well as for me. Hmm. So listen, uh, so Ed, when you first interviewed James Comack back in the mid eighties, like what were your initial thoughts? Like what was your first impression of him? Well, it was a phone interview. I mean, uh, you know, back then it's like, uh, I did a phone interview with him and again, it was just the idea of a tapping into the show any way I could at that point, you know, speaking to as many of these people as I could, but again, it was just his, enthusiasm and the fact that he felt like an episode like a piece of the action unlike like a um you know mark daniels or or uh, joseph pevney that sort of kind of had we're in a format of doing the show a certain way he had the opportunity to really shake things up because yep. you know you could be in the 23rd century on uh on on the bridge of the enterprise but once you go down to the planet it's like and and he even says in the interview that the Kirk, the whole thing about Shatner and Nemo say, well, my character wouldn't do that. Well, you can't tell what your character would do because this environment is so alien to anything you've ever encountered before that your character could do that and will do that and did do that. So uh, just a guy who was really enthusiastic about about the opportunity to do the, to do the show and, and being a part. I think he was really happy with the fact that he was a part of the Star Trek history. Absolutely. And I think that made him feel really good to be, know that he his episode was well regarded and he's a part of that mythology that goes forward. Absolutely. Well, let's listen to that interview right now. Usually when you're a director and you're working on uh, episodic television, you walk into the actors, mostly know their part and who they are and what they do. And all you're really doing is just finding new ways for them to move around. But the, the acting is already locked in because they've done it. Right. This was fun because this is the first time they did a comedy. And Bill Shatner loves to do comedy. I've heard that, yeah. Uh, and Leonard Nimoy, I knew from when I was, did combat with Vic Morrow. I knew him from that uh, time. 
And uh, I populated it with, have you seen the episode? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I populated it with uh, funny comedy gangsters. And uh, then set about uh, doing it. It was a lot of fun. They really enjoyed it. It was a break for all of them because they got away from their normal uh, philosophical, esoteric kind of script into uh, a flat-out comedy of Chicago in the 20s. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. It's an action show. And Bill and Leonard were just terrific to work with. And uh, I was very happy in those days, you know, playing uh, uh, director. Right. But did this, did this episode start as a comedy, or was it a serious study of, you know, contamination, let's say, of our people and their people? No, it was, uh, well, whatever, whatever philosophical overview they put on it to justify being on Star Trek, that was what uh, they put on it. But actually, it was meant to be a comedy. Oh, it was, right from the beginning. Yeah, right from the beginning, they wanted it to be a comedy. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was nice. Could have been funnier. Did you have any particular problems with it? You know, are there any scenes that gave you any particular problem? The gangster scenes in the room were all fine. The outdoor stuff with the cars going by and the bullets going off and them hitting the ground and making some kind of reality out of a back lot, mm-hmm. that was a little difficult. That was, Although I'd done action before, I'd done combat, uh, where I blew up bridges and stuff like that in World War II, uh, they seemed to be more... The company seemed to be more oriented to do that kind of work, whereas Star Trek was, uh, they weren't really into uh, machine guns coming off and people running around and babies on doorsteps. Uh, that wasn't what that crew was used to, so it was a little slower for me mm-hmm. and a little harder for me to make uh, good pictures, serviceable pictures. But uh, whatever the difficulties were, um, Shatner himself is such an enjoyable man. Mm-hmm. That uh, he makes your life easy. You know, they always come up and look and say, you having troubles? Uh, what can we do to help? Uh, well, if you want this, we'll get it for you. You know, right. that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. The other consideration was, in in the Enterprise itself, it's so goddamn technical. Yeah. And what they talk about, I have no idea. I mean, it's <laughs> in the script, but I don't know. And they constantly explain, we know it goes this way. This is the way it is. We're talking about the ramification of a polarization of some kind of uh, thing in the atmosphere. I don't know what they're talking about. But they do. <laughs> yeah. They got it all figured out. Right. And the beam me up stuff, you know, that's a little technical. You just stand there and then you say cut and you freeze the camera. They walk out of the shot and you keep taking the shot and then they do some kind of little optic on it mm-hmm. to make them go away. Right. But all those things they know. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm the director. All I need to do is get them in some kind of position. And uh, then they just take off with all their uh, mumbo jumbo. Right. See, what I th- always thought would be tough in an episode like that, or any time travel story, shall we say, is, uh, maybe I'm off base on this, but did you feel at all that it's tough to sustain this future reality they're trying to co- trying to make, and then combining it with a very realistic, to some degree? Absolutely. That was that was a tough part of it. Yeah. That was tough, remembering that these guys are from another time, and yet we're trying to make a picture about the 20s. Mm-hmm. You constantly have to say, well... It's got to be 20s from everybody else's point of view, but it's got to be future time for Leonard Nimoy and uh, Bill Shatner. Right. And that gets a little bizarre. And the jokes were, uh, they didn't know what was going on around them. They never saw a machine gun. They never saw uh, even pool a car. tables even or a even car. a car yeah. or a baby on the doorstep with a lady. And uh, we'd have to work out the jokes right then and there. Do the react. You'd have to stop and say, wait a minute, you've never seen this before. Mm. I've got to shoot something that shows you've never seen it before. Oh, so that was something that was done on the set, basically. Yeah, yeah, I do that on the set, which is another reason to bring me along, because I'm a writer, too. Mm. So I can write as I'm uh, directing. Right. So that was it. Uh, you said before, early at the outset, that you, you loved Star Trek. You were a big fan of it. What would, in particular, appeal to you about the show in general? The uh, the imagination of it. Yeah. The imagination and the story opportunities. My God, you could dream up any story you want mm-hmm. and uh, tell a, a moral a moral story, a, a moral uh, philosophy that you might have and, and put it into their hands, and they could, uh, with all, all the things they could do, they, they could clone people, they could have people who weren't really alive, uh, then you could talk about life and death, you could talk about a life hereafter, or where you came from. The show gave you all those opportunities. Over the years, I mean, have you ever looked at this, this Star Trek phenomenon and ever wondered about, it, like, what the hell it's all about, so to speak, or... Do you, do you think it's all justified, this incredible phenomenon that's gone on for 20 years? Oh, I think it's absolutely justified. It's the, the same kind of uh, 
attraction that uh, Rod Serling's show had, mm. you know, that still hangs around and people still want to watch it. Right. Uh, my kids watch it. They're 22, 23 years old. They're involved in that, and they're involved in Star Trek. It's something that it's, um, it's a classic form. Mm. It's a classic form of, of uh, fantasy, of um, illusion that you can only create in movies right. or in film, where you can take yourself out of your current time and go enjoy a mythical place at a mythical time and um, believe that life is beautiful. Right. Because they were beautiful. They had enemies like we have enemies, but they had different ways of dealing with them. Mm -hmm. And goodness always prevailed, and the truth prevailed. And uh, it's it's just it's a wonderful escape. It's a great fantasy. It's the same reason that Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs last all these years. Uh, Christmas stories last all these years. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened to Star Trek. It's an absolute perfect fantasy. Mm -hmm. And extremely well acted. Yeah, oh, definitely. Extremely well acted. I don't know what the new one's going to do, but those guys really know how to do Star Trek. Right. You know, when, even when they do their movies, I mean, you're just, they're very, very good actors. They're very convincing and you believe them. Mm-hmm. Which is all you can ask from actors. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> and he's the perfect Kirk. Right. He is. That skinny, no matter what he does himself, 10 years older, 20 years older, he still is the perfect Kirk. Right. And Spock is the perfect Nimoy. Mm. Well, Nimoy is the perfect Spock. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> The, the other thing was that Spock and Kirk came down with this great intellect and this great intelligence that they possessed, and they were, they were dealing with monkeys. I mean, these all these gangsters had an IQ over around room temperature. You know? <laughs> and it was funny to, to, to convince the actor to play that mm -hmm. and then to watch Kirk and Spock stare at them right. because they were just ludicrous. Mm. They had a book. They were going to take over cities. They were mobs. Their, their brains weren't working that well. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a great deal of the fun. You know, I find to be one of the best moments in the thing is when, when they're talking to Scotty up in the ship and they're saying, you know, unless you want to be uh, wearing cement yeah. you know, and then he tries to... <laughs> and he couldn't figure out what they're saying. Yeah, right. And then he tries to bluff it. If you don't want to be wearing cement uh, yeah. overshoes or whatever the hell he said, I don't know. Yeah, remember. that's it. And then uh, the, the gangster wondering what is he talking to and what that magic thing he's got uh -huh. and who does he think he is and let's get it away from him. Right. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. You know, also that, you know what seemed improvised is that card game. God knows if it was or not, but it sure seemed improvised. It was. It was. It was. It absolutely was. You're right. Fizden or something, whatever the hell they called it. They just sat down and um, Shatner really thought of this idea and then I embellished it. And since I say I'm a writer, it was very easy to make the connectives as they went through it. Right. But they did live a lot of it, and then they said, hold it, if you did that, well, let's just say this to get on to the next beat. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of fun, and they, they really enjoyed doing it. Right. I enjoyed photographing it. I enjoyed uh, helping with it. Mm -hmm. Now, were they, I mean, I've heard over, you know, I've heard over the years that they were like, and I guess this is a right attitude on their part, where they would say, well, I won't do that, because Kirk wouldn't do that, or Spock wouldn't do that, so I won't do that. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. That's where they formulate their own characters. Mm -hmm. That's why I said when you go on a, a, a running show, They'll just tell you flat out, hey, I've been doing the show three years. I would never say that. Right. You, you can't argue with the guy. Right. But in this episode, I could say, well, hold it. Now you're down at the 20th century, pal. You, <laughs> you're dealing with morons. Right. You've never done this before, so therefore you could say this. Mm -hmm. And they would buy it. They would buy it that way. Right. But not in the spaceship. In the spaceship, they had the dialogue down. So in other words, you were trying to create two separate realities, I guess. One on the planet and one on the ship. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. That was what the script was about. Yeah. You know, because, you know, you have them almost like by the end where Kirk is like, well, what are you talking about, Dan? Yeah. You've, got, <laughs> you've got them, you know, trying to adapt to their mm -hmm. situation, I guess. Yeah, that was the fun part. Mm -hmm. And they understood that, so they were willing to bend their characters in that time. Wow, what what an amazing interview. And 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 how great to, to be able to share that on Enterprise Incidents. And thank you so much for, for being a part of... of this deep dive discussion on a PCD action and for, for sharing that archive interview so we could hear it instead of just reading it. So, but my question for both of you is, and I'm going to start with you, Ed, is how does your assessment of a PCD action change, if at all, after our discussion just now? I don't know that it changes per se, because just re I haven't rewatched an episode of the original series in quite a while. 
And when I rewatched uh, that episode, a piece of the action, suddenly I found myself watching, as I mentioned earlier, Space Seed, and then A Taste of Armageddon. And it was just, then I decided to watch The Cage. And all of a sudden, it's like I've reestablished my love for Star Trek, not that it ever went away, but my enthusiasm about watching some of the episodes again. And that was like almost a gift because I haven't felt it in so long and to sit there and watch the shows again and enjoy it just as much as I ever did. It's a wonderful thing. Isn't that a beautiful thing to be able to rediscover what it is that you love about something? Yeah. And it's that Kirk Spock McCoy thing. I mean, it's that it's those three guys, man, yeah. no matter the movies, the TV shows, whatever it is. I just love watching them. Just when you thought you were out, we pulled you back in. <laughs> um, happily came back in. I don't know that this will fit anywhere, but but I also found it interesting. We talk about the chemistry between these guys. Watch even this, the beginning of Star Trek Generations and compare that to the rest of the movie, like the opening scene with Kirk, Scotty, and Chekhov. It's magic. I mean, even these yeah. guys who didn't work together that much, the rapport between them is just amazing. And it's like none of the other Star Treks have that in the same way. It's really interesting. I really agree. And, you know, you brought up Generations. Generations, to me, I love the first part of it, and I love the last part of it. Mm. Uh, I don't care for what happened in the middle, <laughs> unfortunately. There you go. So, so, Scott, to answer your question very briefly, I would say more than any other episode we've covered on Enterprise Incidents, my feelings about a piece of the action have changed not at all. I, not I, at all. It's exactly – I, it's, I enjoyed watching it as much as I always enjoyed watching it. I'll enjoy watching it again. Like I said, even though we found some you know deeper things to talk about, this is not a deep episode. It's a fun episode, and it is will always be one of my favorite go-to makes-me-smile episodes of Star Trek. I, I agree with that. I mean, I, in terms of like my assessment going up on episodes like The Deadly Years, where my, my assessment did go up after that deep dive – and my assessment of of a bread and circuses went up big time after that conversation with uh, with Ralph Sinetsky, uh when he joined us. But in this case, like I already held a piece of the action in such a high regard, but uh, just sort of being able to ask you guys about you know was Kirk violating the Prime Directive because I thought about it in a way that that I thought you know was was a little different from the other times. But also, like you know, watching the evolution of Kurt, of uh, Shatner's performance as he got more into the gangster and just the, the the brilliance of his of his of his comic timing and of, and of Nimoy's comic timing and just how great Vic Tabak and Anthony Caruso were. Uh, I love this episode a whole lot. All these years, I, and I absolutely. Uh, I still love it now. And Ed, Ed, you know, you're you're always what writing. Where can people find you on social media and tell us more about about the website you're writing for? Well, uh, on social media, it's at Ed Gross. Easy enough. I'm writing uh, nostalgia pieces for doyourremember.com, and and that's fun. Uh, and I am currently writing an oral history of Superman, a book on Superman, uh, which for me is a uh, is real dream come true kind of thing. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, yeah, so I'm just plugging away and also writing for comicbookmovie.com and their spinoff sites and just keeping busy doing that stuff. And uh, while doing the books on, you know, is the main thing. Excellent. So that, Excellent. That's where I'm at. Well, if people want to find our show on Facebook, you can do a search for Enterprise Incidents. You can follow us on Twitter at Enter Incidents. You can follow us on Instagram at Enterprise Incidents. And you can follow me on Twitter at SR Morris, on Instagram at SR Morris One. And if you like gangster stories, maybe you should tune into my other podcast, The Cinephiles, where you can hear our many, many, many part episodes on Godfathers 1, 2, and 3, and Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. Scott, how would people find you? Uh, you can find me on social media on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. And make sure you share this episode of Enterprise Incidents on your social media platforms so that we can continue to spread the word about Enterprise Incidents, which is a deep dive on the original series like no other. And just like no other, we are going to go by any other name on the next episode of Enterprise Incidents. Rojan of Kelva is hijacking the Enterprise back to the Andromeda Galaxy in an episode I really, truly love, and I'm very excited to get into this deep dive of By Any Other Name. That's next on Enterprise Incidents. Until then, keep going boldly. Bye.